In this video, I'm going to review the circuit building tools that we'll need throughout the class. The first thing we'll talk about is wire strippers and wire cutting. Breadboarding. Using a digital multimeter. And finally, using the N-scope. So, the first task for our wire strippers. Here's a pretty standard set of wire strippers. Uh, there's a lock, a thumb lock, so if you're holding it in your right hand, use this thumb lock to disengage. The cutting area is in the base. The stripping area are these alligator teeth, and then there's a plier tool at the end. The first thing to note about the wire strippers is that they're made of pretty soft steel, so they're only good at cutting wire. Don't use these cutters to try to cut anything else, especially a metal bolt. Uh, the holes are different sizes for different size wire. The wire I provide my kits is usually 26 gauge, so that means you should be using the 26 size hole to remove insulation. So you would put it in the size 26 hole, clamp down, and pull. And right now I'm pulling and it's not quite cutting off, and that's either because the hole is too big and it's not cutting all the way through the insulation, or it's too small and it's cutting through the insulation and grabbing the wire. So I will try a larger hole, smaller number 24, that's not coming off either. I'll try, try a 28, and that came right off. If I try a 30, it barely comes off, and now I'm nicking the wire. So right where I uh, removed that insulation, there's now a little nick in that wire, and it will break if we bent it back and forth enough. So for my particular wire strippers, and uh, uh, this 26 gauge wire, I'll probably use the 28 size hole. And that's just because of the manufacturing of these guys isn't super tight tolerances. So find the right hole for your sized wire. The amount of insulation that you want to remove is roughly the amount of wire that needs to go into the breadboard. So when we stick it in a hole, we don't want to see any exposed wire. Uh, any exposed wire might touch another exposed wire and create a short. If we don't remove enough insulation, it might fall out of the hole. And we'll want to make a nice tight breadboard here and we don't want any of our components to fall out. So that's roughly uh, five or six millimeters worth of removed insulation. Okay, our next topic is breadboarding. So here I've got two breadboards, and these breadboards are actually separate, and they come with little clips, so you can take as many breadboards as you want and clip them together. The purpose of a breadboard is to make electrical connections with springs inside. So a row of holes in the center of the breadboard is one piece of wire. It's one giant spring. So when I stick a wire into row 25, any other wire also in row 25 would be electrically connected. Um, but once you span this gap in the middle, this channel in the middle of the breadboard, this row 25 is different than the other row 25. So we get five holes in a row that are electrically connected, and then another five, um, and then the columns down the side of the breadboard, we call those rails. The rails are electrically connected in columns, not in rows. So this row 25 hole is not connected to this one or this one. This one is connected up and down. This one is connected up and down. So typically we put our power in the rails, we build our circuit in the middles, and then we put more power in the rails. You can physically see that these breadboards are actually three pieces of plastic. So if I spread this apart, you can see that this uh, rail section is not electrically connected. It's not connected at all to this one, only through some plastic clips. So now let's take a look at our multimeter. This is uh, an inexpensive like entry level multimeter from SparkFun. And the first thing you want to do when you get it is you have to put the battery in. So it takes a nine volt battery in the back. Um, and then it has three holes in it. So it says 10 amp com and then uh, milliamp volt ohm. So the black wire or probe should go in com, stands for common or round. And then the red wire would go into milliamp uh, volt ohm. Only if you ever need to measure Current on the 10 amp setting, would you ever use this 10 amp volt? So basically, we can ignore that one. Uh, the first setting I like to check is uh, the continuity or diode test. So I'll turn this over to the diode test. And if uh, we touch the probes together, we get a beep. If I was touching a diode, we would see the forward voltage of the diode. So this is pretty 
convenient for seeing if a wire is continuous. But note that I have to push pretty hard into a breadboard to touch the metal connectors that are in there. So these aren't really sharp enough. They're not really meant to touch like through the breadboard. If you want to touch something uh, on a breadboard, you need to touch the actual little metal connectors. Uh, you can't, don't try to like touch into the breadboard. Uh, the next thing we want to do is see uh, how good are these probes. So I'll put this on a 200 ohm setting and I'll touch the two probes together and ideally it should read zero ohms because I have no resistance in the path. But um, these probes are kind of thin wire, so what do we get? A, a couple of ohms here. So that's pretty low, 0.3 ohms. Um, if you have a not as nice multimeter as this, this might be as high as 10 ohms. And if you had a really nice like fluke multimeter, uh, that would go down to zero. So um, we have components in our kits, and um, one useful thing that we do with the multimeter is rather than to look up or memorize um, the color bands on this resistor, just touch one end of the resistor and the other end of the resistor. And right now I'm on a 200 ohm setting, so if, there, if this resistor was 200 ohms or less, I would see that number. And I see a one all the way on the left, that means the value is larger than I'm trying to read. So I'll bump it up one. And we're on a 2K setting, and if I touch this, I see 0.323. So when we're in the K setting, this value is in kilo ohms. So 0.3 kilo ohms is 323 ohms. So this is 330 ohm resistor. And I can keep bumping up, and that just means my resolution gets a little lower every time. Let's see, we lost a decimal point. So just remember if you're on the uh, mega ohm setting, the value of this will be mega ohms. When you're in the kilo ohm setting, we're in kilo ohms, and then the ohms is just regular ohms. We could do the same with voltage. And then the last thing you might ever want to read is current. Current is the hard thing to read on a multimeter. So if I was in voltage mode, and I wanted to see the voltage across a component, you just touch either side of the component and it would tell me the voltage. Current though is different. Current, I have to read the current that goes through that component. So if I touched both sides of a component in current mode, current would bypass the device I was touching and only go through the multimeter and give me the wrong reading. So when you're reading current with the multimeter, you have to remember to break open your circuit and like break it open and then insert the multimeter into that spot to read the current. Okay, I think we're done with the multimeter. One aside, uh, we, could re we can use the multimeter to read the value of our resistors, but we can't it, for capacitors. It doesn't have a capacitance reading function. Uh, that's more expensive. So when you look at your capacitor, capacitors typically have two little legs and a circle on them. Um, the circle will have three numbers on it, A, B, C. And so how do you interpret the value based on A, B, C? The value is A, B times 10 to the C picofarads. Picofarads is 10 to the minus 12. So, for example, a 105 uh, capacitor translates to 10 times 10 uh, to the 5 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. And when you do that math, uh, this comes up to be 1 micro farad. So those letters are real tiny, uh, so get real close and squint to look at those capacitors. Now the last thing we'll talk about is the end scope. So here we can see our end scope, and it's literally just a board that plugs into the top of a standard breadboard. So if you don't like the positioning of it, just pull it out and plug it back in. The end scope is a four-channel oscilloscope. It's also a bipolar power supply, and it has uh, two sine or triangle wave outs and two PWM outs. So when you plug it in uh, to your computer with the USB cable, Uh, first thing it might do is update its firmware, in which case the green light would blink. Uh, and then you look at your computer and say writing firmware to your device. And when it's done, you can unplug it, plug it back in, and now it has updated the firmware. There. Okay. Um, if the software is open, you'll get all four lights on. So the green lights mean that you have USB communication with your computer. The red and the blue light mean that you have power supplied into the rails, and those powers are plus 5 and minus 5 volts. So we hit the button, we can turn the power supply off, 
turn it back on. And the, the, the way the pins work is rather than having probes like a traditional oscilloscope, we have holes in the breadboard that the channels are plugged into. So if I wanted to see a voltage on channel one, I would plug into a row that is channel one. And in this case, maybe I'll make a voltage on A1. I'll plug into A1, and then I'll be able to see it. I could go into my settings, and I can turn A1 on, and I can have a 1 hertz uh, bipolar 4.75 volt sine wave. And if I wanted to make it faster, I could drag, or I could right click and enter um, the frequency I wanted. So now the frequency is very fast, so this is not a good time setting. So I will increase my time so I can see the sine wave again. And then oscilloscopes always kind of like they take a capture and they display it, take a capture and display it, so it moves around. So we can prevent the moving around by turning on the trigger. And so wherever the intersection of the trigger line and this vertical dash line, that's where um, the data will be started to be collecting and will uh, not move around as much anymore. If I made this a smaller sine wave, uh, the way we interpret the peak to peak voltage here is every big square is this setting, so a two volt setting. So I can bump this up to be two volts ish. So this would be a four volt peak to peak sine wave. And I can zoom in so now it's one volt, and we can see now uh, one, two, and one, two. And then what's the time sensitivity? Every big horizontal square is this time sensitivity. So Two of these is one millisecond, so one, two, three, it's about three, so um, this is uh, not quite uh, kilohertz, and so squeeze this up to around a kilohertz. And so it should be two blocks, looks better, about two blocks. So those are the tools of the trade wire strippers, wire, breadboards multimeter and scope.